Let me start with a story. There was this family, mum, dad, and two kids, and they were a religious family, and one of their religious celebrations was coming up soon, so they were very excited getting everything prepared. Now, the older child was a son named Johnny, and it happened to be his birthday today. Now, Johnny, he always wanted a pet, and his father, saw, his father thought he'd surprise him for his birthday and get him a pet. So he took Johnny out, and they went to the place, and Johnny had a look, and he said to his dad, Dad, look, this one, he's beautiful, he's perfect, I want him. So his dad gave in and got him the cute and cuddly one, and they took it home. When they got home, Johnny and his sister named their new pet Milo, from the breakfast cereal, of course. And uh, Johnny and his sister loved that pet every day of its life. But it only lived for four days, because four days later, their father killed it and made them eat it for dinner. Oh. In case I forgot to mention, the pet was a sheep. And the family who were religious, they were Jews. And the celebration they were waiting for was the Passover. And their names have been changed to protect their identities. Now, I apologise to you if you're a bit taken back by the thought of somebody killing their pet dog and eating it, but of course I tricked you. There were no dogs harmed in my story, but there was a sheep harmed, which was killed. Now, if you still feel a little bit sad or awkward about a sheep being killed uh, in front of the children, well, guess what? That's how God wants you to feel. Because, as we'll see a bit later, it's not really about a sheep. It's about a person. It's about Jesus. And we're going to see that God's plan for Jesus to die on the cross for our sins was far more difficult to pull off than you might have realised. And in order to do so, he had to make the impossible possible. But he was willing to go to great lengths to make it happen because Jesus' death actually changes your everyday life. How does it do that? Well, come with me. As we go on a journey, we'll go through these three points today. Number one, Jesus' death, accident or accomplishment? Number two, God makes the impossible possible for you. And number three, how does believing that Jesus died affect your life? Let's start with our first point today. Was Jesus' death an accident or an accomplishment? And let's look at our text, Matthew 26, verse 17. Let me read it out. It says, On the first day of unleavened sorry, on the first day of the festival of unleavened bread. The disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Now, at first, you might think that passage seems rather straightforward, but it actually introduces quite the dilemma. Let me fill in a bit of context for you, and then that will become clear. First, we need to understand Jewish holy days. The first festival or holy day God ever instituted for his people was the Passover. And he told Moses that it was to be observed on the 14th day of the month, the 14th of Nisan. God instituted another festival that would start the next day, the 15th of Nisan. And it would go for seven days, from the 15th to the 21st. And it was called the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Now, with this one, the Israelites, God's people, were required to remove all the leaven or yeast from their houses. Anyone who's made sourdough knows that you can keep some of the dough with yeast in it and use that to make the next loaf. And you can keep repeat repeating that process every time you make a new loaf. Well, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And when God rescued them, he didn't just want to rescue them physically, he wanted to rescue them spiritually. 
So he gave them this festival as a symbol that when they left Egypt, they also left behind the sin and the evil and the corruption of Egypt, and they started a new life. And that was God's purpose of the symbol of getting rid of the yeast in their house. It would remind them every year that they're living a new life now, that they have, sorry, um, that they're living a new life that's, and they have different priorities from Egypt. And their speech, their relationships, and their morality should be different now. When we become a Christian, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's the same analogy. You might remember the Apostle Paul saying, put off the old self and put on the new self. It's exactly the same thing. Now, the order of the festivals is important. Before you work hard to improve yourself, you need to know whether you're wasting your time because no amount of self-improvement or good deeds is going to impress God. That's why God had the Passover festival first. Just like my story at the start, the lamb was chosen, the lamb was killed, and the blood was spilled. And the first time it was put on the door frames of their houses in the story because God sent his angel to pass over their houses and he spared them because of the blood on the door. They were only spared because of the blood of the lamb, not because of anything to do with themselves or their life or goodness. All they could do is trust in the blood and trust that God would do what he said and save them because of the blood. Now, these are beautiful symbols that God created for our instruction today so that we would be pointed to Jesus, so that it would be clear where salvation comes from and so it would be clear why we're changing our life to a new life. Why? Why are you living a new life now as a Christian? It's not to earn salvation. It's so that in your new life, in God's family, you're a joy to be around. People look forward to seeing you. The point is that we become a blessing to others. Now, the festivals of Passover and Unleavened Bread are right next to each other on the calendar. And by the time we get to Jesus' day, the terms Passover and Unleavened Bread become synonymous. In other words, when a Jew referred to the Passover or Unleavened Bread, they were referring to the same thing, all eight days, from the 14th to the 21st of Nisan. Have a look back at our text. Matthew says it's the first day of unleavened bread, but he quotes Jesus as saying in the next verse that he's going to keep the Passover. It's the same thing. It's referring to the first day of those eight days of Passover plus unleavened bread. <clears throat> now that that's clear, let's address the reason this passage has perplexed so many people who have studied it. Jesus wanted to celebrate the Passover with his disciples. But Jesus died as our Passover lamb. The dilemma is this, how can he do both? Now, as the Bible tells us, Jesus was our Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says, Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. He's basically saying, Jesus is our Passover lamb. It's already done. His blood has been spilled. Trust in his blood to save you. And therefore, clean up your life. So you'll be a blessing to others, not a frustration. Now, just to make it even clearer, based on Exodus 12, verse 6, the Jews' tradition was to kill the Passover lambs between 3 and 5 p.m. on the day of the Passover, which was the 14th of Nisan. In the next chapter from our text today, which is Matthew 27, in verses 46 to 50, he tells us that Jesus died just after 3 p.m. 
That means that Jesus died at the exact same time that the lambs in Jerusalem were being slain for the Passover meal. Is Jesus our Passover lamb? I think yes. Now, can we confirm that Jesus did celebrate the Passover? Well, in Deuteronomy 16, it commands all Jews to celebrate the Passover every year. And we know that Jesus never sinned and he was obedient to God's commands. In the Sermon on the Mount, for example, in Matthew 5.17, Jesus says, Do not think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all mention Jesus sending his disciples to prepare a room so he could eat the Passover with them. If you look at our text today in the next verse, Matthew 26, 18, Jesus says, I am going to celebrate the Passover. And in Luke's account of the same story, Luke twenty-two fifteen, 15, Jesus says, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Remember that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said he came to fulfill the law. On that particular night, Jesus wasn't just obeying the command to keep the Passover. He was fulfilling the command. In other words, this was to be the final Passover forever, never to be celebrated again. Therefore, Jesus was eager to keep it one last time so he could transform it into something new. So let me be clear. Jesus kept the Passover, and Jesus was our Passover lamb. He did both. He both ate the lamb and was the lamb. But how? Well, it all comes down to when your day starts. Our day starts at midnight, right? 12 a.m. Well, their day back then started at sunrise, 6 a.m. That's why in some translations, when it says the sixth hour or the ninth hour, it just means 12 noon or 3 p.m. They're just counting from 6 a.m. But the day starting at sunrise is definitely more of a practical thing, right? Because if we remember back to the first chapter in the Bible, it says, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And so the day might start at sunrise, but on the religious calendar for the Jews, it started at sunset, or otherwise known as the evening. Let me read to you from Leviticus 23. I'll just read a couple of verses. In verse 27, it says, The tenth day, remember ten, of the seventh month is the Day of Atonement, another festival they had. It is a day of Sabbath rest for you, and you must deny yourselves, from the evening of the ninth day of this month until the following evening you are to observe it. In other words, the day doesn't start at midnight. It starts the previous day, at least in our mind, at sunset or at evening. So the Jewish day was sunset to sunset or evening to evening. Let me also read to you Exodus 12, 17 to 18. It says, celebrate the festival of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. In the first month, you are to eat bread made without yeast from the evening of the 14th day until the evening of the 21st day. So clearly, the day of the Passover festival starts in the evening at sunset. Well, not exactly. You see, there were two different schools of thought as to when the, the festival should be celebrated. The Galileans in the north, along with the Pharisees, celebrated the day of Passover from sunrise to sunrise. But the Judeans in the south, along with the Sadducees, celebrated the day of Passover from sunset to sunset. Now, for those of you who don't know what a Pharisee or a Sadducee is, they're just basically the ones in charge of the Jewish religion at the time of Jesus. They were the Jewish leaders. But Pharisees and Sadducees didn't always uh, get along because their beliefs were different. It's a bit like Catholics and Protestants. Anyway, because of their differing beliefs, 
they celebrated the Passover differently. Now, in order to explain the difference to you, I need to use the screen. So, I've made a chart to show you the difference. So pay attention. Passover was on the 14th of Nisan. The Pharisees and Galileans considered the day to start at sunrise. That means the day ends at sunrise the next morning. And Jesus celebrated the Passover that night. Remember, he's a Galilean along with his apostles. Now, the Sadducees and the Judeans considered the day to only start at sunset. So the 14th of Nisan, the day of Passover, would go from sunset to sunset. According to them, the lambs were to be slain and prepared for the Passover meal from 3 p.m. onwards, which is at the end of the day, exactly when Jesus died. In fact, if you look at the chart, you can see that according to the sunset to sunset model, Jesus actually ate the Passover lamb and died as the Passover lamb on the same day, the 14th of Nisan. He ate at the start and he died at the end. How incredible is that? That such beliefs would converge and such events concur so as to allow Jesus to fulfill everything on the right day. After all, we did read in the Old Testament that God prescribed sunset to sunset to be the official way to count festivals such as the Passover. Now, that brings us to our second point. God makes the impossible possible for you. Why is all this so important? Why does it matter that Jesus kept the Passover and why does it matter that he died as our Passover lamb? I want to give you two reasons. Reason one, has anything ever happened in your life that you later reflected on and thought to yourself how unlikely it was that such events took place? Have you ever looked to the future and wanted two different things to both happen, but you knew they couldn't both happen, only to think back later and realize that somehow both things were able to happen? Perhaps you have an important meeting at work and your child has their first music recital at the school at exactly the same time. You can't make both. But when you think back on it later, you realize that because your boss was sick that day, the meeting was postponed and you were able to attend both. Or perhaps there was a power outage at the school and the recital was delayed with perfect timing to allow you to make both appointments. Did God do that? Maybe. I'm not saying that he did. But I'll tell you what. He can do it. God can always find a way if he wants to. The fact that history played out the way it did to allow Jesus to both eat the Passover lamb and be the Passover lamb, which would not have originally been possible, shows that God will make what seems impossible, possible, if it matters to him. Do you matter to God? Do the circumstances of your life matter to God? Don't think he's not willing to make the impossible possible in your life. But God doesn't just do it for the fun of it. God made the impossible possible for Jesus so that Jesus could point us to God. Do you think God should make the impossible possible in your life? Are you going to take those circumstances and point people to God and how amazing he is? Or are you going to draw the attention to yourself and how lucky you are? The choice is yours. But let me warn you, giving thanks to God when you don't think he's real is No difference than giving thanks to luck. And if we're lucky, well, it's all about us. But let us pursue God and and know him so we can give him the honour he deserves. The second reason why it's so important that Jesus both kept the Passover and died as our Passover lamb is this. In dying as our Passover lamb, 
Jesus fulfilled the 1,500-year-old prophecies that Moses wrote down in the Old Testament. And he also affirmed the teachings of the apostles in the New Testament. And it was important that he kept the Passover with his apostles one last time before he died so that he could give it new meaning, so that he could transform it, really, so he could bury it, and so he could bring to life something brand new, something that is no longer just for Jews, but for everyone, for you and for me. Let me show you with our final point today. How does believing that Jesus died affect your life? When you research the Passover, at least in the modern context, it always seems to refer to the Passover cedar. Now, I didn't know what that meant, but it's not that complicated. The word just means order, order of service. We have an order of service here, right? We sing hymns, we have an announcements, we have a Bible reading, we have a sermon. It makes sense, right, to have an order. With no order, we'd have chaos. Or as uh, it's commonly known, the uh, Wednesday night speaking in tongues Bible study. Uh, no no uh, risk of that here in an Anglican church. But of course, the point is the Passover had an order to it. Now, the Passover service has existed for three and a half thousand years. That's when Moses lived. So it's likely to have changed during that time. So we can't be dogmatic and say we know exactly how it happened in Jesus' day, but we can still get a pretty good idea when we look at history and we compare it with the Bible. So with my research on this, I believe the Passover cedar looked like this. Now, I've put it on the screen as a visual, but I want you to just get an idea of what it looked like. Don't be too concerned if you can't read the text. I know it's small. I just want you to get an idea by looking over it. And I'll just give you a really quick summary so you can get an idea in your head. In the first five points, they drink two cups of wine, they have a ceremonial hand washing, they eat some vegetables, and they break a loaf of bread, but they don't eat it. In the next five points, they have another ceremonial hand washing, they break two more loaves of bread, and they do eat them, they eat bitter herbs, and they sing some psalms. And in the last five points, they finally eat the lamb for dinner, they break the first loaf again that they broke, and now they finally eat it. They drink two more cups of wine, and they sing some more psalms. And that's the service, quite involved. Now, I want to draw your attention to the last four points on the list. And I've enlarged them on the screen so you can read them. The last bread is broken and eaten. The cup, which represents redemption, is drunk. Hymns are sung, and the final cup of praise is drunk. I think it's clear that Jesus used this part of the service to introduce the Lord's Supper. But have a look at your text in Matthew. Verse 26, he broke the bread. Take and eat. This is my body. Verse 27, he took the cup and said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Verse 30, they sang a hymn and then they left. What's missing? The fourth cup. He never drank it. They never finished the Passover service. He left it hanging. Why? Did he forget? Did he run out of time? No. The entire Passover service looked back to the time of Moses and the Exodus, except for the fourth cup. The fourth cup, the cup of praise, looked forward. It was the only thing that did. It represented, it represented praising God for the Messiah who is to come. So Jesus purposely skipped the fourth cup. He never finished the Passover service. I want you to listen to John 19, 28 to 30, which I'm going to read out. And this happened only a few hours later when Jesus was hanging on the cross. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that Scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, 
I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. The last cup has been drunk. The final Passover meal is finished. Your salvation has been accomplished, purchased by Jesus' blood. Jesus said his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of sins. When Jesus died on the cross, that was a moment of victory, for he accomplished what no one else could. He took all your sins on himself so that they would not be counted against you, but against him. But in order to do this, he had to be humiliated. Not just the humiliation of the crucifixion, In order to do this, he had to give up his home with God and become a man. That would be like you or me giving up our humanity to become a fish, to save some of the other fish in our own fish tank. That's humility. (laughs) But that's what Jesus asks of you. He's not asking you to become a fish. He's already done that part when he became a man but he's asking you to be humble. He's asking you to be humble enough to acknowledge that you are a sinner. And he's asking you to be humble enough to admit that you need a savior. Are you willing to admit that you can't make it out of this life on your own and stand before a holy God? Who better to have alongside you than God's own son who humbled himself and became a man and then died for your sins so you wouldn't have to. This life is full of uncertainty, worry, and doubt. So I urge all of you, whether you're a Christian or not, or somewhere in between, I urge you to trust in the blood of the Lamb. For it is in his blood and his death that Jesus declares he's made a new covenant. In this new covenant, God is no longer far off. You can actually know him through Jesus, his son. God said at the start of the Bible that when he creates this new covenant with us, he will take the very words from his mouth and put them on our hearts. And each one of us will know him personally. And when he looks at us, he will forgive our sins and remember them no more. If you're not a Christian here today, I urge you not to trust in yourself, but to trust in the blood of the Lamb. For that trust means that you can actually meet God and know him, and he will not count your sins against you. If you are a Christian here today, I also urge you not to trust in yourself, but to trust in the blood of the Lamb. For your relationship with God depends on it. If you ever find yourself wondering why maybe you can't remember the words in the Bible, or you wonder why sometimes God feels distant to you, or perhaps you wonder why sometimes you still feel guilty for your sins, it's as simple as this. In those moments, we need to remember what it is our trust is in. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust your own ability to overcome these challenges. Trust in the blood, in his death. Your creator, the author of life, died for you, his creature. How crazy is that? And what does this look like for your life? What does it look like to trust in Jesus' death? It's when someone at work or at school gets you in trouble for something you didn't do and you want to hate that person. But you remember that Jesus took the blame when he wasn't guilty. In fact, you're the one who's guilty, but he died for you and it humbles you and you don't feel hate anymore. It's when you feel sick or depressed and nobody can comfort you, but you have the privilege 
of praying directly to God. And you feel his presence right with you. And he gives you peace and he's able to comfort you. It's when you hurt someone or you betray their trust and you feel like you don't deserve to be forgiven. Well, you don't deserve it, but you remember he doesn't offer you forgiveness because you deserve it or because you're good enough. No, he only offers you forgiveness because you trust that Jesus is good enough, the Lamb without blemish or spot, sacrificed for you. Let me finish by asking you a question. Do you trust that because of Jesus' death, your life can be changed? You can know God and all your sins can be forgiven. That's what God has promised us if we trust in his Son.